And the question then is what happened? What happened to the harmony, the peace, and the, the provision um, to mankind? And it's obvious we no longer live in the Garden of Eden. We no longer live, have this paradise, but we live in a broken world. It's full of sickness. It's full of death. It's full of injustice. It's full of suffering. And we beg the question, what went wrong? And what we know from what the scriptures teach is that sin entered into the world by the disobedience of our parents, Adam and Eve. And we, as their children, not a separate line of humans, but a line of humans falling underneath our parents, Adam and Eve, have experienced this kind of spiritual death that leads to physical death that all humans experience because sin has now entered into the world. The scriptures teach us that not only has sin entered into our experience, not only has it affected the human heart, but sin has affected creation itself so that we see all kinds of natural disasters. And this, of course, as we know it, is not how God intended for it to be. It's, it's like a separation between friends. Have you ever experienced a brokenness in relationship and experienced the heartache that comes with that? Maybe it's a close friend or, or, or someone like that. But there's a breach in the relationship, and perhaps it's because of something you've done, maybe it's something they've done, maybe it was really nothing any one of you did, a mistake, but the other just can't get past it. You felt that? You know, the, the lack of sleep that can sometimes accompany those uh, relational, that relational uh, distance, the, the restlessness that even I feel, if it's significant enough, there's a, a restlessness throughout the day when I think about the distance between me and someone, and even sometimes a lack of sleep at night because of that. Sometimes there can also be a, a longing for restoration and even a despair that maybe things will never be made right. When sin entered into the picture with Adam and Eve and then every subsequent human, including you and I, it not only breaches the relationship between us and has potential to, to bring division between us, it's a break in our relationship as humans with God. And this is what's called spiritual death, a separation from God. It's a loss of relationship. And this explains the, the longing, the deep longing in, uh, among humans for significance, for meaning, a deep longing for a sense of purpose in life. It explains the restlessness that accompanies the human heart when we are not in relationship with God. And I think for, for, the, for us, the way we would understand that is that there, there are really a couple of ways to understand the effects of sin. And as I mentioned earlier, the first is that sin has an effect on our own hearts. We are sinful, we are broken. But then sin has its effect on creation itself so that there are natural sins or the consequences of sin that, that don't necessarily come from our own doing or our own idolatry or even from someone else's sin or the evil that they afflict, inflict upon us. Some of the consequences of sin existing in the world are not directly from our own doing but a part of a broken and sinful world. Someone who becomes sick, someone who's born with maybe a malformity of some kind, someone who uh, perhaps experiences a natural disaster. These are all things that are not necessarily tied to any person's sin, just a result of sin in the world. Now, we may not all be in the same situation, but we still can lament over the consequences or the results of sin in the world together, even if they're our own fault, but especially when they're not. God is working to renew everything, and it will all be fully restored and fully renewed when he returns to establish his kingdom. And this is made possible because of Jesus, who endured the full brunt of our brokenness. He endured brokenness relationally from all of his disciples, and as we're going to learn in just a little bit, Jesus experienced brokenness in relationship with everyone around him. It says the Gentiles and the Jews. It was everyone conspiring against him. <clears throat> and Jesus, God the Son, experiences the full weight of brokenness in relationship with others. But even there on the cross, he experiences the weight of what, what God's wrath should have been poured out on us, being poured out on him for our sins since he did nothing wrong. 
There's this experience that Jesus goes through to experience the full weight of our brokenness so that as he dies and then rises again from the grave, he can confidently say and extend to us new life, that he has power over all of those things that would inflict us with pain and suffering. He has power over sin, our own sin, or the sins that others inflict over on us, inflict to us, and even power over the effects of sin in the world. Jesus has the power to overcome sin and to overcome death. And as a result of that, he has the authority to extend that resurrection life to us. What this means is quite a number of things, but one of them is that when it comes to our own sin and our own struggle with sin, every time we sin, it's not just another mark against us. Every time we sin, it has been paid for on the account of Jesus, dealt with and paid for by what Jesus did. There's hope for us here in the good news of Jesus, and it's that he has overcome our own sin. He has overcome the sins of others. He has the power to overcome the natural consequences of sin in the world, and we can trust him. Where sin affects us in our own hearts, it's not the end of the story. It's me having a conversation with my son just this week, saying, son, yes, you are in trouble. And yes, he's asked me if he's always gonna be doing the same thing over and over again. And my response to him is, yes, son, you're in trouble again. And yes, you're probably going to do this again. And yes, there probably will be consequences if you do this again. But no, I do not abandon you. Yes, I will always be with you. Yes, we will always be friends. Yes, I'll always be your dad. And yes, God can always use you. He will always take you. There's a tension there that I think for us we have to acknowledge, and that is that, yes, there are consequences of sin, and yes, we are experiencing those sins, but but the promise is because of Jesus and what he's accomplished for us that he will never abandon us, never forsake us. And every time that there is sin, whether it's the sin of my doing or the sin of your doing or the sin of some evil person shooting up in in Virginia Beach or the sin of some other evil or some other tragedy or some systemic issue, even in our nation or around the world or whatever problems that you see, the answer and the good news is that this is not the end or the final say in how things will be. It's not how God created things. And it's not how they'll be when he returns and establishes his kingdom. We are in a middle ground, a a point of tension, an area where God has already overcome through what Jesus has done for us, and he is at work renewing all things until he completes the work in the end when he returns. So it wasn't ever this way. It's not going to be this way. And what we experienced, even this last weekend, or whatever else we're experiencing by way of brokenness and sin, is not the beginning of the story. It's not the end of the story. It's a blip in eternity, really. And God has promised us that he can make things right. In all of this, God is working to restore and to renew And everything is moving to the day he returns and sets everything right. Until then, we struggle with sin. Until then, we see the effects of sin around us. In all of this, what can we say? What can we do? And I want to point us to these uh, three things that should be up on the screen. We can lament, which is a cry to God in anguish. We can lament. We can remember the truth, the good news about Jesus. We can praise God. As we think about lament and remembering the truth and praising God, we turn to these two truths that always give me confidence when I'm struggling to find faith or when I'm tempted to doubt or despair. And the first is to look back to the cross of Jesus, and the second is to look forward to the return of Jesus. Those two things combined give us hope. So in just a second, I want to talk about those things. But first, I want to talk about lament and then look at those two truths to remember them and then move us into some praise. There's a book in the Bible called Lamentations. Have you heard of it before? It's somewhere in the front. It's near Jeremiah there. And so you'll be able to find it if you've got a table of contents. But this book is called Lamentations. It's a book written by Jeremiah, and it's 
The term to lament really is a passion, passionate expression of grief. It's an expression of deep sorrow. It involves a cry for help. It involves the confession of sin, either ours or someone else's, or it, it either involves the, the, the innocence of our, our own doing. And, and at times it re- involves the reminders of truth, and it always ends with praise to God for listening to us and for sending us help. And I think we might overlook the, the notion of lamenting as a church, taking some time to lament before we move to the quick sayings like it's all going to be okay, everything's okay, everything's going to be okay, God has a plan, and the other kinds of things that are true, essentially, but maybe not always the most helpful in the immediate. And so for us, as we think about lament, we want to look at what it means to lament and to spend some time there first before we move to some of those truths that we remember, like God does have a plan. He will not forsake us. He will not abandon us. So it sounds simple, but for there to be true lament, there has to be freedom to express your grief, and there has to be someone to hear that lament. Without freedom to express your grief, you end up with it getting bottled up. You end up with depression. You end up with other sorts of issues. And without the freedom to, for someone to hear that lament, you end up in isolation. This seems pretty basic, but it, isn't it striking how God in the scriptures where we see these prayers of lament from God's people, how God allows his creation to voice their frustration and to properly lament their sorrow. He doesn't stop them, he doesn't chide them, but he listens and he welcomes them as they pour out their lament to him. Even when they're suffering because of their own sins. He doesn't say, I'm not gonna talk to you right now, you go to your room and you think about what you've done. (laughs) He welcomes that conversation, he listens. And as we endeavor with God to pour out our laments, a relational connection is established. And from there, he begins to share truths that we are reminded of that can restore the heart. What I guess I'm saying is when we have neighbors who are struggling, when some of us are struggling, our first response is to sort of help with answers to the problem. Well, you just need to know this, you just need to do that. When I think for us as believers, it might be good to take the posture of our Lord who listens to us who cries with us, who relates to us and empathizes with us. This is how the scriptures present our Savior. And so this, for me, is how I think we want to relate to others. And as we read through the Bible and read the many prayers of lament in the Psalms, Lamentations, Habakkuk, there are a number of books and a number of Psalms that really are a prayer of lament to God. It seems that God is allowing the writer to vent in some places. It seems that God is listening, and we might miss it, but I would argue that God is actively listening, not just sort of waiting for a chance to say, you're wrong, and so here, let me straighten you out. Actively listening, using lament, using the process of of verbalizing what we're feeling to bring about healing and restoration of faith. Even at a few points along the way, even at the the end of many prayers of lament, what you see is the writer of the, of the, the prayer, the lament there, the passionate grief, expression of grief, you see the writer turn to restoration. It's almost as though the writer, the one giving the prayer, feels heard. It's like they've exhausted themselves and then fall down on the promises of God at the end of their lament. It's, it's really something any counselor would tell you about listening to those who lament. When listened to, understood, validated, the sufferer is no longer uh, isolated and, and healing can occur. God is bridging that gap for us. And in doing so, by sending his son Jesus to take our place and to relate to us by becoming fully human and experiencing all that we're tempted with and experiencing all that we suffer, he has become to us someone who can relate, someone who dearly loves us and listens and and has the ability to bring healing. This, I think, is what it would look like for us to be in the image of our Savior, Jesus to listen, to love, to seek to help. This, for me, speaks of the transformative power that your presence, just like the presence of God in the person of Jesus and the presence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit here with us today, your presence 
has a transformative power in the people's lives around us. Simply being present has the ability to remove the isolation and open up the door to healing. This is a time for us, like they were at Pentecost, to be out in the public square. This is a time for us to be out listening, loving, helping to bridge the gap, doing what we can to serve and as we have opportunity, sharing the hope we have in Christ. So how can we be present? I think that in Lamentations uh, 2, 13, it tells us, this is Lamentations, this is the book of the lament that Jeremiah has. He says, what can I say about you? Who has ever seen such sorrow? O daughter of Jerusalem, to what can I compare your anguish? O virgin daughter of Zion, how can I comfort you? Your wound is as deep as the sea, who can heal you? This is a a passage that we studied uh, several years ago when we looked in Lamentations, and so I've just sort of brought this into our message today because I think there are steps here to actively listening in lament that really are patterned after this phrase. He says, what can I say about you? And the first is to acknowledge the hurt. What can I say about you? Who has ever seen such sorrow? The next is to seek to understand. He says, O daughter of Jerusalem, to what can I compare your anguish? Help me understand. How do I compare this, what you're experiencing, to something else? Let me listen. Let me learn. This is the prophet lamenting and actually learning to listen here. He's acknowledging the hurt. What can I say? Who's ever seen this kind of sorrow? Oh, daughter of Jerusalem, what can I compare your anguish to? And then he goes on to seek even to be helpful. How can I comfort you? He doesn't have his own ideas about ways to remediate the issue. He says, how can I help? And then he goes on to acknowledge the need for for God's help and God's healing. For your wound is as deep as the sea. Who can heal you? These would be, for me, ways we can engage with others in a time like this or at any other time as we mature as believers and are able to minister as ministers of the good news to the people that God places in our lives. We are acknowledging the hurt. We are seeking to understand. We are seeking to find ways to be helpful, and we are acknowledging the need for God's healing. To take place. Without lament, I think we lose the benefit of integration. We lose the benefit of actually being changed or transformed because so many of us want to just skip the transformative effect that suffering can have on us. We don't want to go through suffering. We don't want to go through these hard times. We would much rather avoid them, and it's in these hard times, in these sufferings, where we actually learn about the nature of our own inability and sheer dependence upon something or someone and the nature of God's dependability and reliability and our need to turn to him and trust him. This would be the purpose of of obedience through suffering. And even Jesus learned obedience through suffering. He learned to depend on God's power. He learned to see with new perspective You notice Jesus even lamenting on the cross. Now, he's quoting Psalm 22, which has a a triumphant ending. And so it's to remind the people that even though he's suffering, there will be a victorious end. But nonetheless, Jesus on the cross actually says, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? In a prayer of lament there on the cross, he at once is able to relate and sympathize, empathize with us. Jesus cries out and lament upon the cross, and who listens to him? Who comes to his rescue? No one. All but the women and one of his followers. Everyone abandons him. No one helps. He dies. Jesus cries out in lament, and sometimes even in our lament, it feels like no one is listening. It feels like we've been forsaken. It feels like maybe those families have been forsaken, but here's where lament reminds us. When we pray out to God in deep anguish or lament, it reminds us of the truths about God. In the very same book, Lamentations 3, verse 31 to 33, it says, for no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. No one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, 
He allows it. He brings it. He also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. For he does not, listen to this, he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. These are the scriptures I'm reading. I've prayed for people to be healed, and in some cases they were miraculously healed, and in many cases those I've prayed for were not healed. A few times they ended up passing away. Were they abandoned? Was I abandoned? Were they forgotten and forsaken? Were, they, were my prayers unheard? Are we no longer loved by God? No, not if we believe the promises, not if we believe what he's telling us to be true. The promise isn't that you're not going to go through difficult seasons of life that feel like being abandoned or forsaken. The promise isn't that you're not going to experience the hardship of of things like what we've experienced this weekend. It's happening all around the world in in many different ways. The, The promise isn't that we would never experience sin of our own doing, sin of someone else's doing, or the effects of sin in the world in some way. Actually, we will experience all of that. The promise is that because Jesus was completely abandoned, forsaken because of our sin, we will never be completely abandoned or forsaken. In fact, we're never anywhere close to that. His promise is his presence. Do you remember that just a few weeks ago? His promise is that his presence would be with us. It is unending. It will never go away. His love is always there. We will never experience the full weight of of neglect or abandon. We will never experience the full weight of condemnation or the wrath for our sin because Jesus has absorbed it all, dealt with it, and then he rose from the grave saying, it's all done. And none of it stands against you anymore. You can come to me. We can live forever. That's good news. And this is our hope. This hope of his promise to live with us forever. And if we're going through a season of suffering or deep sorrow, you're going to need someone to listen to. I'm going to need someone to listen to. And wouldn't it be nice if you could know that God himself was more than just willing to listen to you, but that he had taken action, steps to make a relationship with you possible. There's not a single doubt in my mind that for you, the first step in healing, and for us, the first step of healing, would be taking a step of faith to bring that prayer of lament to God. And even though, because I know that my soul is eternally well with God, it is well with my soul, even if everything else is wrong, everything else is broken or devastated, my soul is safe and secure But I think it's also true that at times it's not well with my soul. It doesn't feel well with who I am. We take these prayers of lament to God. Just the same way I would say to someone who is not a Christian, you don't need to clean up your act before you come and receive the forgiveness that God has for you and the relationship he wants to have with you. I would say the same thing to any one of us that is a believer struggling because it doesn't feel well with our soul. You don't have to wait until it starts to feel better before you can make an appropriate prayer to God. You can bring your lament to him and he will hear it. You can pray. And this is the beginnings of the restoration process that God wants to do in each of our lives. And as we learn to lament, we learn to listen to those who lament. The impossibility of listening to others these days, I think, stems from, the, an, uh, from a neglect to really bring these laments to God ourselves. And so I think we want to take that step of faith to bring this lament to God. And if you've never realized that Jesus was forsaken so that you could be free, would you embrace Jesus personally as your Savior today? Would you come to see the truth that you are not abandoned or forsaken, that you will never be condemned when you come to Christ and receive him, that he has done everything possible to make a way for you to God and that all you have to do is to receive this good news, to believe it, to act on it, to take a step of faith and say, I believe this and I receive this good news. Save me, God. Heal me, God. Restore me, God. These are steps of faith that I would encourage any of you to take today. I encourage you to take a step of faith and to follow Christ with us. 
We want to talk to you more about this during communion today. And maybe you're going through a season of lament, but for those of us who may not be going through a season of lament, my prayer is that our church would be equipped to do the hardest work of reconciliation, actively listening to the lament around us and using what margin we have to remedy it in some way. Culturally, socially, politically, whatever we can do to remedy it after we've listened after we've lamented and listened to those who lament and we work together to to resolve the issues. This is exactly what God has left us here on the earth to do, to proclaim the good news so that we would alleviate all suffering, especially, as John Piper puts it, especially spiritual suffering. We're sharing the good news, but we're also listening to the lament. And as believers, with all kinds of margin, because our Father is rich, we can ask him to meet the needs of the people around us. We can serve that way. And so I'm encouraging us to think of ourselves that way as ambassadors of the good news of Jesus. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 21. If you're taking notes, just write that down. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 21. This is where the scriptures call us to be agents of reconciliation. We have the message of the good news and we have the ministry of the good news. And we need to be doing both as a church because we're living in a time of of lament. So I'm wondering how you and I and our church and those churches in this area who are sharing the gospel with folks, I wonder what it would look like to lead the display, what it would look like to, to lament together, what it would look like to listen to those who lament and what change that might bring as we empathize and lead to action. It's here, I think, in the listening where lament begins to heal. Listening breaks the pattern of isolation and allows healing to begin. And, e- and since evil exists in the world, it does exist. None of us are denying that. The church will in- inevitably will address this evil by entering into that experience the way Christ was incarnated, with the way that he came into our experience, becoming fully human. We will enter into the experience and we will work by proclamation and demonstration of the good news of Jesus to advance the kingdom of God while resisting and overcoming the present evils of our day. We can do this, not in our own strength, but because we've been empowered and commissioned by Jesus to do it. So you're not an engineer. You're not a mechanic. You're not whatever, I mean, that's part of who we are, but we, wherever we are, have a primary identity as that of an agent or an ambassador of God's kingdom. And then we have tons of secondary identities, mom, dad, worker, student, whatever. But I want you to see that wherever he's called you, wherever he's placed you, whatever neighborhood you live in, whatever job you have, these are all strategic outposts for the kingdom of God, and he's placed you there as an ambassador of the kingdom. We're thinking through, how do I proclaim this message so that it's good news for the hearer? I want to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And we're thinking, how can I demonstrate the good news to them? If I'm saying that God can forgive them, how do I demonstrate what forgiveness looks like? If I'm saying God can heal them, how do my actions demonstrate that I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually moving towards healing and restoration? If we're saying God wants a relationship with them, then what does my relationship with them look like? Does it at all demonstrate the good news I'm saying? This, I think, is what it means to be an ambassador. In light of this kind of lament, I think we have hope. And almost every prayer of lament in the Bible comes with a statement of hope and a statement of praise. I'm running out of time, but I want to give a statement of hope. I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier, looking back to the cross, looking forward to the return of Jesus. When we look back to the cross of Jesus, we learn that God is always in control, even when it seems chaotic. I want you to go to Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 27 to 28. You can read the whole chapter, Acts chapter 4. I think it's a fascinating message that Peter gives. But I want you to look at Acts chapter 4, verses 27 to 28. Read it with me. It says, In fact... This has happened here in this very city for Herod Antipas and Pontius Pilate the governor, the Gentiles and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. Is there anyone left out? There's the governor, there's Pilate, there's the Gentiles and the Jews. Everyone 
has conspired against the anointed one, the holy servant, Jesus. Verse 28, in the midst of that chaos, everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. Everyone conspires against Jesus, and everything seems like chaos. And what we learn when we look at the cross, when we see that moment that seems like such mass chaos, the the whole world rebelling against the Son of God who came to love, to seek and to save that which was lost, whose mission was to demonstrate love. He says, I came not to condemn the world, but that through me the world might be saved. Someone like Christ coming and being crucified, rejected, rebelled against by everyone there. Does that not seem like chaos? Does that not seem like the strangest turn of events? Like the worst possible scenario for the best possible guy? And what we learn here when we look at this cross and when we listen to Peter and the way he understands is that, that everything they did, even in the midst of that chaos, was determined beforehand according to God's will. There's more we could say about this. But for now, what I'm saying is that it's important to remember that God will hold evil men responsible for their own sins. I can explain that to you at some other time. What I want you to see is that while everything is happening around us, even if it seems chaotic in our lives, he is sorting everything out according to his plan. He's never not in control. Nothing ever catches him off guard. He is never surprised by our own actions or the actions of someone else. When life seems chaotic, I think we have to remember to look back at that moment where Christ is setting everything right on the cross, where the work for forgiveness of our sins is being accomplished there in the midst of so much chaos. And what Peter teaches us is that this is exactly the way it needed to happen, that God was never not in control. That God would never, although he allows hardship and suffering, never abandon us. And that everything he allows and everything he brings is working together in a grand plan that we can't possibly understand at every moment. And that's why it calls for faith. That's why it calls for trust. Not only can we look back to the cross, but we look forward to the resurrection of Jesus and to the return of Jesus, I'm sorry, to when Jesus returns to set everything right. Jesus is coming back. Just as surely as we believe he came, which no one thought he would, he's coming again, which many are beginning to think he won't. He's coming again, and he's coming to set everything right. He's not just going to come away like men in black and just you know, make all of our memories disappear so that all the hardship goes away. I'm saying he's literally coming to set everything right, to look someone square in the face and to deal with what they've done. There's no greater truth. I think because maybe we're, we're comforted with ease here in America, there are those really suffering around the world. There's no greater truth to them to, than to know that in the end, God's not just gonna sort of pass someone off into annihilation, but that they will be dealt with for the evil things that they have done. We're resting in this good news that Jesus will come and not just make everybody forget everything, but set everything right. This is good. This is our hope. Now, there's only so much we can do in the world for all that we want to set right. And so I think at the end of the day, there's some despair for those of us who are trying so hard to do so much good. And I think the hope is for us that even when we try and even when we give ourselves to all that God's calling us to do, to right what's wrong in this world and to proclaim the good news, at the end of the day, we're still waiting for when Jesus returns to set everything right once and for all. And this is good news too. We look back to the cross and we look forward to the return of Jesus and we are waiting here for him. So I'm asking you today to trust him. What I'm asking you to realize is that we have a future with Christ that is secure. We have a deep-seated confidence in the one we know who is coming to restore all things. He has a plan for the universe So certainly he has a plan for your life. And certainly you can trust him. Would you trust him today? I'm not saying come and then let all of your worries go away. Come and let everything that you're lamenting about go away. Come and then just let everything go. Don't worry about it anymore. I'm saying come and leave it with Christ. I'm saying come and hand it over to someone who has the ability to do something about it. And then ask him humbly in the next few days what he wants you to do about it. 
But I think the first step is to come and to lament, to bring that to him, to lay those things with him saying, in effect, you're the only one who can do something about this. And our eyes are on you, Lord. Let's do that together as a statement of our faith and hope. There's always praise at the end of a prayer of lament. God is so good, even if our circumstances want to lead us to believe differently. He's still good. He loves us. And our enemy wants to lead us to believe differently, but he loves us, and the scriptures teach that. He's not abandoned us. Our past experiences may lead us to believe that it's happening again, but he has promised to not abandon us. We may think we're unlovable or unworthy or better off alone, but he has not left us in that condition. He has promised to never abandon us. And we speak these truths as we lament and then remember these truths. It leads us to praise. It leads us to thanks. In Habakkuk, this guy who was a prophet and and gave such a strong lament over all that was happening in his time, he ends the book after such sorrow and grief, which you should read about. In uh, chapter 3, verse 17, he says, Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, even though there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, these are all the worst conditions, even though the flocks die in the field and the cattle barns are empty, yet, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He's holding me together. This is our prayer of praise at the end of our lament. What we see here is Habakkuk coming to terms with his faith in God. He's learning to trust in God. His faith is resting in something unseen. The eyes of his hope have been lifted from his circumstances to see the greatness and and even the glory of God himself. His contentment, his joy, are not necessarily found in the restoration of all that he's lost. Because in losing all that, he's realized what he needed most was God. And in that, he's found a source of joy. I think he's, his perspective has been humbled and he's learned everything we're talking about now. This Friday night, I want us to take some time to praise God. We're gonna look at, at Pentecost Sunday next week. We're not gonna be here at the Sandler. We're gonna be out there at the oceanfront on the 31st Street stage with people from our city. We're gonna be singing. We're gonna be sharing the good news and you're gonna be standing ready, linking arm in arm with me to share the good news and the hope that we have with the people of our city. We're gonna go out, we're gonna do this, but the Friday night before that, this Friday, we're gonna take some time to lament together, to remember the good news, and we're gonna praise God together to share about the wonderful things that God is doing. And what I want us to do is to, is to experience this good news that, that when, not, not if we go through suffering and hardship, but when we go through suffering and hardship, that we would remember that God often uses these things to make us more like Jesus and to bring glory in our lives, through our lives, to himself. I think we're most like Christ when our lives glorify God and when we can live by faith in this present sort of middle age or middle condition. We glorify God when we're trusting what we can't see. And it's not blind faith. It's just trusting what the Bible says when it doesn't seem like it. And our faith rests in these unseen truths and promises of God's sovereignty and his salvation here. And so I want to call us to turn to God and trust him today. Let's pray. As the band comes, we're gonna spend some time in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for a chance to worship. Thank you for a chance to come before you and acknowledge that we are utterly helpless in a time like this. And at many times in our lives, we're confronted with our own sheer helplessness. God, we look to you for the help we need. We look to you to save us. And there are many of us who are grieving, many in our city who are grieving, many are lost, many asking, for, asking questions why and how and, and what we can do. And so, Lord, I pray that we would do all we can to really bridge the gap and serve, that the people of God in Hampton Roads would, would, would proclaim the good news of Jesus and demonstrate that good news by a posture and disposition towards people that would be welcoming and hospitable 
that we would leverage all that you've called us to do for a chance to share how good you are and how genuinely uh, loving you are towards them. Of all things, we're probably most misunderstood about your intentions. And I pray we as a people would demonstrate and proclaim the truth about your goodness and your power to heal in these moments. For now, I pray that we ourselves would practice lament and that we would come to you and bring our prayers to you and trust in you wholeheartedly. Make us fully devoted people, holy and set apart to you, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name.